Hey there. In this video, we are going to look at changing the amplitude of sine and cosine functions and make connections between how changes in the equation and changes in the graph are connected. All right, now we're going to use Desmos here to investigate making changes in the amplitude of sine and cosine functions. I'm going to use sine here. We could use cosine and we'd see the same result. That's our basic sine function. Now you may or may not know uh, that when you multiply a function by a by a constant, like we we change this into y equals four sine x, change it from sine x to four sine x, you see what change that causes in the graph. Now there's our basic sine curve, right? It has a period of two pi, it has an amplitude of one, it has a maximum of one, minimum of negative one. You've seen that before. If we Think about specific values that we're putting in here, like say this point right here. When the x value is pi over two, when you put pi over two in here, you get one as a result. Pi over two gives you one. Now, if we think about what's gonna happen to that point when we make this change here, pi over two gave us one. If we put pi over two in here, this is gonna be one. But now we're multiplying by four here, so the resulting y value is actually going to be 4 instead of 1. So the point that was pi over 2, 1 is going to become the point pi over 2, 4. If we look at this point, something similar is going to happen. The point 3 pi over 2 gives us negative 1 in our basic sine function. So if we put 3 pi over 2 in here, this gives us negative 1, but now we're multiplying it by 4, so it's going to become negative 4. The one that was 3 pi over 2, negative 1, goes to 3 pi over 2, negative 4. The y values are becoming four times as much. In fact, that's true of any function. If you take a function and multiply it by a constant, it gets all the y values are multiplied by that, by that constant. We'll look at one more point here. This point that's uh, right in the middle of that first cycle of that graph. Pi gives you 0. If we put pi in here, we get 0 here. If we put pi in here, we get zero here. We multiply it by four, it actually is still zero. The point pi zero stays as pi zero. That point's gonna stay the same. Now, you've probably been waiting for me to click this for quite a while to see what the graph looks like. It looks exactly as we predicted for those three points. This point that was pi over two one is now become pi over two four. It's four times as far away from the axis. This y value is four times as much. And the same goes for this point over here. Three pi over two negative one is now three pi over two negative four. It's four times as far away there. And the point, let's get rid of these for a second. And this point in the middle here, that point pi zero hasn't changed. This is an invariant point. You call this an invariant point because it has not changed. In fact, all of these intercepts that are on the axis are invariant points. And all of these maximum points are now four times as far above, and all of these minimum points are now four times as far below. You have caused a vertical expansion by a factor of four when you multiply that function by four. The amplitude is four times as much. All right, now, if we make this a number, a different number here, like I chose a number uh, like four there. I'm gonna put a, a small number here. I'm actually gonna put a fraction. One divided by four down there. If we multiply it by a quarter, then we think about what happens. The same thing's gonna, same kind of thing's gonna happen here. That point that was pi over two, one. Pi over two, one. This is pi over two, this is one. But now we're multiplying by a quarter, or dividing by four. That point that was pi over two, one is actually gonna become pi over two, one quarter. This point over here that was 3 pi over 2, negative 1, is going to be 3 pi over 2, negative a quarter. And that point right there is not going to change as well. That one's actually going to be vertically compressed by a quarter. Every point is a quarter the as tall. There's the 1, there's the, the quarter, the 0.25, like we predicted. And that one is negative 1 and negative a quarter. And then those same points are invariant along the way there. Now... You can actually see this a little more dynamically if we put a variable in there 
and then we add a slider that we can see how it actually changes as we change things in real time here. So that's uh, the A value of one. If we make this bigger, as we saw before, right, when that's a four, it's four times as tall, five times as tall, six. And if we make the value smaller than one, smaller than one, it gets vertically compressed. Bigger than one, it gets vertically expanded. And this slider lets me go into the negatives here. So if I go to there, actually zero, if you put a zero in front of it, every single Y value turns into zero. So it's just this degenerate curve. It's a straight line, a horizontal line at zero. But if we go into the negatives here, it actually causes a vertical reflection. So the fact that that's negative one, if this is negative one times sine x, it's not actually changing the absolute value, the number part of it. It's changing the sign, not the it's changing the sign, the positive negative sign, not the sine sign. It's uh, this val this point that was pi over two one is now become pi over two negative one, and this point that was say three pi over two negative one is now three pi over two one vertically reflected. If you have both those things, like you put a negative three then both those things have happened. It's been expanded vertically and reflected. So it's three times as far away and each part goes the opposite direction. If you look at this numerically in a table here, we have the x values and we have our basic sine function there. And then we have two other ones here. We have the four sine x like we graphed and I combined the negative and the one quarter that we put together there. So we'll look at comparing these two first of all here. If we fill these values down. Okay, that actually is just coincidental. That ends up being the same thing there. We'll fill it down to there. We're not gonna have one complete cycle, but we have, uh, we have a half a cycle from zero to pi for the angles. And those values go from zero up to one and back down to zero, like you've seen before. If we have a look at the values for this, if we fill this down, all of those values are four times as high. Any value here for the same x value, the y value is four times as high. So it's not just that maximum point, it's every value along the way is four times as much. And you see that the zero and the zero down here don't change, they're invariant. If we follow this one down, there's gonna be actually two changes that happen, right? Because there's gonna be the fact that uh, as compared to this, this is one quarter as much and it's the opposite sign. These are all positive, so those are all negative. If we continue it on down here, then you're gonna see the same thing. Except that this is in quadrant three here, and quadrant four is where sine becomes negative. So then that four sine x, those are negative, but this negative one quarter sine x, those become positive now, they're the opposite sign, right? So. You see that relationship when you look at it graphically and you see that relationship when you look at it numerically here in a table. So in general, when you change the equation so there's an A value other than one, you have a vertical expansion when the absolute value of A is greater than one or a vertical compression when the absolute value of A is less than one. And that is by a factor of A in each case, bigger or smaller. And also, of course, there's a vertical reflection if A is less than zero. So now we'll draw a few different sine curves that have different amplitudes. This first one has an A value of three, so it's amplitudes three. It's been vertically expanded by a factor of three. I'm gonna draw this midline here, even though it's on the axis, we probably don't need it. It has a max of three, a minimum of negative three. I'll draw a couple of guidelines at the top and the bottom just to help me locate some key points. We know that since it's a sine curve, it's gonna start in the middle and then has a period of two pi so that it's back in the middle at two pi. Halfway in between those, it's in the middle as well. Halfway in between the first two points, it's at the top of a cycle and halfway between the second two, it's at the bottom. So that's kind of planned out one cycle, and then we can just continue with the dots to map out the rest of the curve. And then we can use those key points to try and draw in a rough curve that represents the function. Now this next one with that A value of 
is going to be vertically compressed. It's going to be so short that I won't even bother drawing any guidelines. It's going to start at 0, 2 pi, pi, and just one space up and down there. And then we can just follow that same pattern and then sketch that curve in there to represent 0.5 sine x. This third one here with this negative 2 has an amplitude of 2. And the fact that there's that negative there means that there's going to be a vertical reflection. But we can plan it out the same. We're going to have our maximum at 2 and our minimum at negative 2. It's going to start at 0, the middle, just like before. It's going to have the period of 2 pi. And so we put a dot there and there. Now, in between the first two, instead of being up like this, since it's reflected, that part's going to be down. So we'll put a dot at the bottom there. And that part is going to be up because it's reflected. All the highs are low and all the lows are high. We can continue that pattern to fill in the key points for the rest of the curve. And then we can draw a rough curve through it to represent that negative 2 sine x. Now, we're going to summarize some of the key information for each of these functions. The period of all of them is 2 pi. The amplitude, of course, is different. We have 1 for just sine x, 3.5, and 2. Of course, the maximum minimums are going to be different as well. The regular sine curve has negative 1 to 1. Then we have negative 3 to 3, negative 0.5 to 0.5, and negative 2 to 2. All of them are all real numbers for their domain. They cover everything. The range is going to be connected with these different maximums and minimums that we have. The basic sine curve has a range of y is greater than or equal to negative 1, less than or equal to 1. And these other ones, second one here, y is greater than or equal to negative 3, less than or equal to 3. The third one is between negative 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. And this last one, y is greater than or equal to negative 2, less than or equal to 2. And then one last thing we're going to look at here is the connection between the amplitude and the maximum and minimum values for the function. For example, how's this 3 connected to this negative 3 and 3? Now, something that's important to realize here is that the amplitude is half of the difference between the max and the min. Now, that might be obvious, but we're going to write a little formula here for it that we're going to use in future. The amplitude is the max minus the min divided by 2. Probably not so necessary at this point, but moving forward, when we're working with more complex functions with lots of transformations, that'll be quite helpful. All right, so that's a look at amplitude change in sine and cosine functions.